Guess what day it is? Are you struggling to play the latest games because your PC just isn't up to the task? Is your new handheld not quite as powerful as you were hoping for? With Maximum Settings Cloud Gaming, you can get access to a powerful gaming PC in the cloud with the ability to stream a wide range of games and programs to nearly any device. Powered by a foundation of open source software like Linux Mint, Proxmox, Sunshine, and Moonlight, you'll have access to a Linux desktop, all pre-configured with Steam, Heroic Games, Lutris, and more. Virtualized gaming machines start at just $9.95 a month Canadian, or around $7.40 US, and you'll be up in gaming just a few minutes after creating your account. Or for uncompromised performance, opt for bare metal access with an AMD 7800X3D CPU and a Radeon RX 7900XT graphics card. I've demoed self-hosted cloud gaming on this channel before, but not everyone's crazy enough to have a server rack out in their garage. Get the flexibility of a cloud gaming system without the hassle of building and maintaining it yourself. Visit MaximumSettings.com or click the link down in the video description to get started today. And thanks to Maximum Settings Cloud Gaming for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff, and it is new server day. My favorite day of the month and uh, some of your least favorite day of the month. Uh, simply because when I find a good deal, it usually means you're all about to spend some money. So this is the ASUS ESC 4000 G3, and it is a server with a very particular set of skills. And actually, outside of those specific features, it's actually pretty pedestrian on the inside. We're looking at a pair of 2011-3 Xeon CPU sockets that support either V3 or V4 CPUs, a total of 16 DIMM slots, 8 per CPU, each supporting quad-channel memory up to DDR4-2400. Connectivity on the rear of the server isn't really anything special either. For networking, we've got a pair of Intel 210 gigabit network ports, as well as a dedicated management port thanks to an A-Speed AS2400. There's also VGA and a couple of USB ports. Up front, it's much the same story. We've got eight 3.5-inch drive bays supporting SATA 6 gigabit connectivity thanks to the Intel C612 integrated SATA controller. There's no support for SAS or NVMe, so you're not going to be getting blazing fast I.O. out of the front of this server. However, the drive trays do have one nifty little trick. They support both 3.5 and 2.5 inch drives, no need for an adapter. And that's a feature I wish most server companies would adopt. For that full list of features and specs, this is not an unreasonably priced server either, coming in at about $235 used on eBay. But of course, there's one big thing that I didn't mention, and it's what I'm going to be using the server for. Let's say you have a stack of enterprise graphics cards that you're wanting to test out. What server do you use them in? How do you get standardized benchmarks? Or what kind of server would I deploy enterprise graphics cards in in this day and age? Well, this is one of my favorites I've found so far. You see, I didn't buy this server for its Haswell CPU internals, or its gigabit networking, or its SATA drive trays. Again, all that's pretty unremarkable. What I bought this for was to house a whole bunch of video cards. Slides out like that. And here is where the fun part comes in. You see, each of these sleds, of which there are actually two of inside of the server, have four PCI Express X16 slots, meaning this server has a whole lot of PCI Express connectivity. But you notice the size and shape of these particular sleds, almost like they were purpose-built to hold graphics cards. And you'd be right, because the features for the graphics cards don't end there. You see, enterprise graphics cards, like this Tesla P40, rely on chassis airflow to do their cooling. There's no active fan on here, just a passive heatsink. Well, this server happens to have a pair of 80 millimeter blowy Matrons in series that direct air toward and through any graphics cards that you have installed. There are also two 8-pin EPS headers per side, meaning we can connect up to four EPS 8-pin plugs to power graphics cards that require EPS 8-pin. Also, because there's so much power available and it is EPS, you can also break each EPS connector into a pair of 8-pin PCI Express for powering AMD Radeon Instinct cards like this MI25. I've been looking for a very long time that met what I would consider to be my ideal server configuration. And I think I finally found it. You see, every time there's a break with 
crypto over the last five or six years, we start to see servers like this in the enterprise graphics space start to dip. But then there's another trend that immediately scoops them all up for the taking whether that's another crypto trend, or in this case, people using self-hosted AI. So what is the plan for today? Well, we're gonna put everything together and at least get this beast powered on, but we will not see the server in its final configuration with graphics cards and running games quite yet. Part of today is to also see what I'm missing. There are some things about this server that are going to make it a little bit difficult. In particular, my server is missing the power connectors to actually allow me to plug in the graphics cards. So I'm either going to have to source some connectors, which I have not been able to find thus far outside of a two-year-old eBay listing, which is no longer in existence, or by potentially making my own. As far as the hardware goes, I figured I might as well go all out. For starters, with the CPU, we have a pair of Xeon E5 2697V4. These are Haswell-based CPUs with 18 cores and 36 threads each. That's actually a very important number to me, as ideally, when the system is done and all my testing is done, I would like to use this as an eight-player games host. If all eight of those systems are configured with four cores and eight threads of CPU, that would consume everything on a 16 core chip. I wanna leave some CPU threads untouched for the OS to be able to utilize. So 18 cores was a pretty good option. Now there are 22 core chips on this platform in the 2699v4, but those are about three times as expensive. These chips are coming in for only about $50 on eBay right now. Now, system memory was a very similar situation. There are eight channels of memory to fill inside of the server, and to utilize all of my memory bandwidth, I wanted to use them all. So I grabbed this 256 gigabyte kit of DDR4 2400. 2400 being the max speed that the server actually is able to handle, and 256 gigs of memory means I will be able to give 24 gigabytes of RAM per VM and still have about 64 gigabytes left over for the OS to utilize for ZFS and other overhead tasks. Now storage is the big wild card on this one. I've ran multi-headed gaming machines in the past and storage has always been one of my biggest bottlenecks. That is when you're trying to install eight virtual machines at the same time. Even NVMe drives, even multiple NVMe drives, tend to not be able to handle that amount of random I.O. from multiple clients. So we're gonna go with a little bit of a different solution this time around, or at least we might. Starting off for the OS, I'm running a pair of 240 gigabyte NVMe drives. That's it. These are gonna run the OS and nothing else. As far as storage for each individual client, I have a couple of different options. I can stripe or raid together a whole bunch of drives and then just run into the same single IO bandwidth limitations that I've run into before. Or what I might end up doing is we have eight drive bays on this server. I might give each VM its own 1.92 terabyte Patriot Burst drive that it can utilize for itself, meaning I'm not going to be sharing bandwidth among virtual machines. Each machine will get its own dedicated storage. Now these VMs, even with the graphics cards split up, are not gonna have the most dominant performance when it comes to gaming. But what I'm hoping for is 1080p at medium settings in pretty much every game that's out there right now. And I think, that actually will be achievable. The really cool thing is unlike a lot of my other tests within virtualized gaming, this 2U server is going to house everything internally. There's no separate file server. There's no weird networking. There's no weird offloading of the storage. There's no iSCSI drive connections. Every VM is going to have direct bare metal access to the hardware it needs inside of this box. If you wanted to build a graphics server for yourself, this is one of the most affordable options that I've found. Now, while the server chassis was only $235, it does take a heck of a lot of RAM and even more storage. The whole build, as you see it right here, minus graphics cards and minus cabling, which we'll talk to a little bit after the servers together, is about $1,631 bought on eBay today. That's a lot of money to spend on a Haswell-based server, but at the same time, it is 256 gigs of DDR4 registered ECC and a full 16 terabytes of flash storage. 
Graphics cards have been plummeting in prices lately, and I'm hoping that trend continues. Cards like the P40 are available for as low as about 150 bucks, same with the P100, and then there's also some options on the AMD side that I'm hoping to take a look at. So, in theory, you could be into an eight-player gaming rig. $2,000? Like I said, first things first, we need to get everything together and make sure it, number one, actually fires up. And then figure out what all I will need to do to get the graphics cards powered on. But I think that's going to be a problem for another day. For right now, let's fire this thing up and see what kind of performance we get out of these two 18-core CPUs. <laughs> Welcome back. So it is a couple days later and I did learn some things. Number one, the power cable issue is not going to be nearly as difficult or as expensive as I had feared. You see inside the server there is a power distribution board on each side of the server and it's designed to feed out 12 volt EPS power to each of the banks of GPUs. Essentially there is one 8 pin EPS header per GPU, four of them in total. Unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as getting an 8-pin to 8-pin female extension cable like the one I have here because the 8-pin is broken into 4 plus 4 down on the power distribution board. Now, also unfortunately, it's not just the 4 plus 4 that you normally have, which are actually two dissimilar plugs. It is the 4-pin A, not the 4-pin B connector. Luckily, this actually might end up being pretty simple to do, and I already have all the parts that I need to make my own custom cables with this exact layout. I think I spent about $65 in total to get all of the cables done, so not a bad deal considering I didn't have any of the tools on hand already. And as soon as I get that all worked out, I'll be posting another video showing you exactly how to do that. Secondly, I ordered a set of sliding rails for this server and it turned out to not be the correct set of sliding rails. So right now the server is just kind of sitting in my server rack on top of my UPS and my AMD Epic Roam server. Not the most ideal situation, but I do have the correct set of rails on the way. Those should arrive sometime early next week. And lastly, I did just a really quick run through Cinebench to do some CPU performance testing on these CPUs. And what do you know? They wound up being essentially the fastest Haswell CPUs I've ever benchmarked. Funny thing, seeing as how they're the third highest SKU ever made. In Cinebench R15, we get a multi-threaded score of 4660 and a single-threaded score of 138. Those are definitely numbers we can work with, again, considering we're only aiming for four core eight-threaded virtual machines. Now, that might seem like still a pretty slow number and not the most cores per system. Most modern games should have no problem at all running on CPUs that are that slow, especially considering we're not going to be cranking graphic settings all that high. Again, we are working with these enterprise GPUs that are at this point eight plus years old, some of them. I have done a little bit of testing recently on a recycled PC that I brought back from the dead running modern games on just four cores and four threads. And those results were not terrific. Having four cores and eight threads should make pretty much every game playable for us. But I think that's where we're going to leave it for today. I am very excited to get this system together and finally working, and to start testing all of my backlog catalog of Enterprise GPUs. I want to test out both NVIDIA and AMD GPUs, pretty much every configuration of virtualized GPU, vGPU, MXGPU that I can come up with, as well as probably throwing in some consumer cards into that mix as well, getting a nice top-to-bottom comprehensive list of what works today, what is worth your money, and which card is better than the rest. Now, obviously the server did end up being a little bit more expensive than I anticipated at $235 for the base server. I then end up buying two sets of rails for $85, one of which was the correct set. And obviously I have to make my own cables from scratch. That's another $65 and probably a couple hours worth of time making sure that I get the right cable connections. Uh, but overall, I'm pretty thrilled with how this is turning out. As always, if you're interested in picking up any of the gear that I showed off in today's video, I will have affiliate links down in the video description. Go give those a look, and if you do buy anything from those, I do get a small kickback, and it helped keep the lights on around here.
On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. And again, if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in crazy projects and builds like this, head on over to craftcomputing.store and pick up some of my merch. We've got everything to help you start drinking like a pro, like coasters and custom pint glasses, whiskey stones. I've even started carrying minimalist wallets with uh, some really fun designs on them. And one of my favorite ones is, uh, what if Maurice Moss was in Pulp Fiction? I think this is what his wallet would say. And that's going to do for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. Here for today is from Frame Brewing up in Portland, Oregon. It is their South Pacific IPA clocking in at, I forgot to check, 6.8%. Holy crap, that is crystal clear. <laughs> this is the beer I should have demoed my Vortex Nucleation with. Holy crap, that looks amazing. I know I'm supposed to review this, but I cannot get over how crystal clear that beer is. That is absolutely remarkable. I can see everything straight through it. Flavor-wise, it's very muted on the aroma, even with the help of my nucleated glass. When you're pouring the beer, you do get some of that, that hop aroma coming out. It's like freshly cut grass, but like six houses down. It is very, very subdued. It is not intense. It's a, oh yeah, I kind of smell that. Flavor-wise, this is an IPA that is as crisp as a Pilsner. It is sharp. It's very sharp. The flavor, while being fairly bold, doesn't last an exceedingly long time. It's almost like a hopped sparkling water. It's not LaCroix. Think of like a Klaus Haller or something like that, where it's actually got a fairly rich body to it, but then it drops straight off a cliff and it's just kind of gone. And that's what I mean by crisp. It's very refreshing. And speaking of fresh cut grass, this may have to be my new done mowing the lawn beer. It's that good.